This episode of Ridiculous History is brought to you by Miller Lite. Oh, no, your voice is smooth as butter. Hey, I got a question. How does Miller Lite do it? You know what, Ben? I'm not entirely sure. I'll tell you what I do know, though. That is that Miller Lite has more taste and only 96 calories and just 3.2 grams of carbs. So you're telling me with Miller Lite, I'll never have to compromise on taste again. A beer so good I can drink it with my mouth? Mind blown. Yes, sir. Same here, pal. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Let me try an announcer voice. Miller Lite. Hold true. Bonjour, friends and neighbors, ridiculous historians, uh, longtime listeners and new listeners alike. Welcome to the show. My name is Ben. My name is Noel. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, <laughs> and we want to, of course, give a shout out to our super producer, Casey Pegram. Only today he is he is but here in spirit. That is true, Noel. That is true. Today uh, is our first episode while our longtime friend is adventuring abroad. It doesn't feel right. I think we're in good hands because we're not alone in this endeavor. We are joined by uh, one of Casey's longtime friends, our super producer, Paul Deccant. I like to think, you know, we're, we're all friends here. We, we hang out with Paul. Yeah. Oh, Paul is solid gold hit. He is indeed. He is. And uh, listeners, you may recognize him from some other shows we have done, including Stuff They Don't Want You to Know, where he earned the moniker Mission Control. Only this is the first time we've personified him with a uh, sound effect. So hopefully we we can bring that back. Yeah, hopefully so. And... You know, Paul, I'm really glad you're here for this one. I think you are going to enjoy this show. Let's let's lay it out very quickly. Maybe we go in with a little bit of biography because today our episode has a couple of primary characters. I'm going to go ahead and say the protagonist for today's show is Napoleon Bonaparte. You think so? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess he's the protagonist. Yeah, he's, he's, he's sort of a, he's, he's a bit of an antagonist in the big picture story. Sure. But in today's story, he is the one what gets uh, a thrashing. He's sort of an Elmer Fudd character in this one, to be honest. He really is. He's quite, uh, quite cartoonish indeed. And we are talking, of course, about uh, that Napoleon, the Napoleon, not dynamite, but Bonaparte, who was born in August of 1769, the 15th, and passed away in May of 1821. I did not know this. He was actually born in Corsica, um, and you know, which which was uh, actually seceded to uh, France, but he grew up in more of an Italian culture, and then moved to mainland France and learned the French language and went to military academy, rose quickly in the ranks, and as we know, uh, spoiler alert, became one of the uh, greatest conquerors uh, in military history. And also, you know, uh, one of the shortest guys in military history. Also always had his hand tucked into his uh, his hoodie. Yeah, we've got a pretty fascinating article from our parent website, HowStuffWorks.com, by Lori L. Dove, who recognized from a couple of other shows. We should done. give her a sound effect, like a like a cooing dove or something. Hmm. You know what? I'm going to write to her. Yeah. And see what what kind of because hopefully she doesn't hate doves. That's true. We want to see what kind of what kind of bird she likes. Right? Okay. Fair enough. Uh, th- she wrote this article called "Was Napoleon Really Short?" And at the time of his death, he measured five feet two inches in French units. In modern measurement units, that's the equivalent of five feet, six and a half inches, or 169 centimeters. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's below average. It's not, you, you know, it's, it's roughly 
average for person at time, it's definitely on the shorter end of the spectrum. But this played into some propaganda. For sure. And people would say, uh, you know, that's where the Napoleon complex comes from. Right? It's also one of these things where when you think of a, a military tough guy, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of want to think of like a hulking, big, burly dude. Mm -hmm. And the notion of him being a little more um, uh, uh, slight mm -hmm. is a little bit counterintuitive, you know? Right. And it makes people think perhaps he's a bit bantam or, you know, cocky, for lack of a better phrase. There's there's a funny thing, though, because he did not help his situation in terms of his perceived height. He surrounded himself with very tall soldiers. Mm. He exaggerated the effect because when he's around all like if you were to hang around uh, the, the Chicago Bulls or something. Oh, yeah. Just hang out during the day as you do. You would look short. Oh, yeah. Because they're. Tall. They're giants. Right? So it's a big, compared big contrast. Yeah. And he also, regardless of his height, he was notorious for having a belligerent, mean-spirited personality. He for was sure. that militaristic person you are describing. Yeah, I mean, he basically was a dictator. Um, he overthrew the French government, which was a revolutionary government that was installed after the end of the French Revolution, that its primary concern was just kind of big-upping uh, revolutionary figures mm -hmm. and uh, folks that, that helped overthrow the, the Bourbons, the monarchy. Um, but then not such a great... Um, efficient government, a lot of corruption, a lot of problems, and Napoleon was already off uh, winning big military victories during this time and basically set up a coup and knocked those boys right out of the frame. <laughs> yes, yeah. He had at a time a, a tenuous grip on power because, as you said, he was pursuing military goals in Egypt, I believe, in Italy. Yeah. Right? He was already traveling abroad. But today, we can look back on Napoleon through any number of lenses, and we chose to look at a story that is, I would say, well, first off, it's funny. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Apocryphal, perhaps? Perhaps. It, 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 it smacks of um, mm -hmm. legend. Exaggeration, at yeah, least. I yeah, I think so, too. Um, but it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it involves Napoleon being swarmed, dare we say, overtaken by a cute little bunny rabbits. Mm -hmm. a, a force of rabbits doing what many armies could not. And as the internet memes are so fond of telling us, the thing about Napoleon is that he attack, but he also protect. I don't know this one, Ben. You don't know this meme? Uh-uh, no. I'm, I'm going to send it to you. It's, it's, don't worry about it. Can we post it on Ridiculous Historians? Sure. Yes, we can. Our, our, our Facebook community? Yes, check out our uh, Facebook community page, Ridiculous Historians. You'll get to meet your fellow listeners. You can even see uh, kids' pictures of the quister himself, which was a bit of a coup for us. Indeed. Uh, so we we first need to set the scene for this hilarious misadventure. Uh, you see Napoleon being a brilliant military mind, understood the importance of not just military conflicts, but of larger diplomatic actions. And he was involved in the negotiations of treaties. One incredibly important one was the uh, series of agreements, two agreements known collectively as the Treaties of Tilsit. Yeah, he had wiped the floor with Austria, Russia, and Prussia. And basically, the Russian czar Alexander I just tapped out and said, look, this is embarrassing. Um, you have outnumbered us, outgunned us, outmanned us, and outclassed us. He didn't, I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing here. Sure. Um, but he said, let's talk, Napoleon. Um, and so he, along with the uh, Prussian king, Frederick William, um, got Napoleon to agree to uh, parley. Mm -hmm. Right? Is that the right term? Parley? Yeah, yeah. They held parley. They, uh, they, met in the town of Tilsit in 1807 in July after his victory at Friedland. 
Yes, and that would have been uh, modern-day Sovetsk, Russia. Um, and what happened was, in order to meet on sort of relatively neutral territory, um, Napoleon and his crew uh, built a crudely fashioned raft that they floated up on the banks of the river Neiman, where they met uh, the Prussian and Russian envoys. Um, well, it was actually, you know, the king and the Tsar, along with their uh what do you call it? A coterie? Yeah. Oh, sure. And they decided to negotiate peace. Um, Alexander the first said that this peace would be just good for the world. It's, it's what everyone wants, it's what everyone needs, although it seemed pretty self-serving. Right. And there were winners and losers in these negotiations. And Tsar Alexander I um, was quoted in saying that this peace would, quote, ensure the happiness and tranquility of the world. It's a, it's a bold way of looking at it, uh, although it seemed a little more self-serving um, since they more or less had no choice because Napoleon had taken them to the mattresses. Right. He, Alexander at least, needed a way to spin it as a win for his government and his people. That happens today with treaties in every situation. Additionally, Napoleon was on the cusp of establishing hegemony to absolute control of a region. Total dominance, and that was his primary concern, right. was spreading French control across the world. And, you know, eventually, I mean, he would say French, but he was really thinking Napoleonic control. Well, exactly. He was a, a dictator. Right. So here's what happened in the treaty. Alexander I accepted the reduction of Prussia from 89,120 square miles to 46,032 square miles or uh, 119,223 square kilometers for everybody outside of Namibia, the United States, and Myanmar. Well, what did King Frederick William have to say about this? In everything I've read, he sure seems like he was second banana to, to Alexander I. Was he even there? I think he was there. He was just in the room. Yeah, here's the thing, too. That uh, that barge or raft that mm -hmm. we mentioned that uh, yeah. Napoleon and his crew floated up to the banks with um, had these giant uh, white tents built on, t on top mm -hmm. of them where he could kind of have his um, camp, I guess. It was sort of a mobile floating camp. And on each side of the tent were an initial. On one side was N for Napoleon. On the other side was A for Alexander. Mm -hmm. But the Prussians were a little bit salty about the fact that their king didn't get an initial and sort of set the Tone, didn't it? Yeah, and Al but Alexander one was, I think, the operative force on the other side of the negotiations. So I named the reduction of Prussian land, but that wasn't all. Uh, they also had to create a duchy of Warsaw for Napoleon's ally, the King of Saxony. Past the duchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Past the duchy, right? And the establishment of the Kingdom of Westphalia in northern Germany, this solidified his hegemony because Westphalia was also partially composed of former Prussian lands, and Prussia itself was going to be occupied by French troops until the French government had received 120 million francs. Ooh. And um, speaking of keeping it in the family or, or making it all about Napoleon rather than mm -hmm. France, Westphalia was established largely um, to give his brother Jerome something to rule over. Uh, yeah. Jerome was the, uh, the Jerome the first of Westphalia. So. <laughs> you might not hear as much about as you would Napoleon. Old, old Jerome. Old Jerome, also in the story. Uh, in addition to these publicly acknowledged aspects of the treaties, there were secret Provisions. Ooh, I don't know about this, Ben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were secret provisions. Napoleon agreed to help Russia liberate eastern Turkey. Oh, okay. Yeah, if Turkey rejected French mediation in its conflict with Russia, then secretly the two, the two powers agreed that France would say, okay, you don't want me to make peace with you guys? I'm going to help Russia eat you. Well, that the sounds, eastern half. Yeah, that sounds uh, intense. And then Alexander, in return, promised to join the continental system against British trade if Britain rejected Russian mediation in its conflict with France. This is all just so sexy, Ben. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned that because they, uh, because these two guys got along famously, and you and I found a strange 
turn that their relationship took because you see the public was aware of these negotiations between Alexander I and Napoleon. Oh, yeah. And the public really took this and ran with it. They shipped them. You guys know about shipping? It's like, right. like uh, uh, fanfic. Right, where, some, where a fan or a community of fans wants two characters to be involved in a specific type of relationship. Yeah, specifically a, a bit of a steamy relationship. And here's what we do know about the, the relationship between Alexander and Napoleon. Uh, th- like you said, Ben, they got along famously. Apparently, um, they spent a lot of time together dining during these negotiations that lasted for several days. Um, they would be hanging out alone together uh, late into the evening. Um, they were seen hugging each other and holding hands. They exchanged handkerchiefs mm-hmm. uh, and even uh, cravats. What is that, like a, like a little tie? Yeah, yeah, it's it's like a kind of decorative neck, like an scarf. ascot. Yeah, similar. The thing that Freddie would wear in Scooby Doo. Uh yeah, similar, similar. Okay, similar. It goes around your neck. So here's the thing: Alexander um, and Napoleon really dug each other. In fact, there's a quote from Napoleon from a letter that he wrote home to his wife Josephine, uh, where he said, "If Alexander had been a woman, I would have made him my mistress." Um, so this fanfic thing really started to take off where you've got all these images of, of these two dudes, uh, embracing each other. There's even a few of them, um, kissing and it really took, uh, the public's imagination by storm. Right. They, it did. And this was, the letter was written in 1807, uh, same year of the negotiations And as far as we can tell, the letter seems sincere. Additionally, Napoleon described Alexander in a quote as, especially handsome, like a hero with all the graces of an amiable Parisian. This is awesome. It seems, it seems awesome. And one thing we do know is that Napoleon, at least, in this will they, won't they uh, uh, relationship, Napoleon was in it to win it. He genuinely believed this, but other uh, other experts and historians think that perhaps this was a misstep on his part. In a PBS examination of this, uh, historians note that this was, quote, Napoleon's biggest mistake. He thought he actually did charm Alexander. What Napoleon didn't understand was that Alexander would never stick to their agreement. But for Napoleon, the Tilsit peace seemed to be his finest moment for him and his empire. He came back to Paris in 1807 to a huge celebration. And as you mentioned earlier, Noel, some very strange and specific art. In a way, this thread or this this thought about Napoleon's relationship to Alexander continues in the modern day with uh, some historians such as Frank M. Richardson even speculating that he was what we would consider bisexual. Right? Yeah, I think that's kind of not given a whole lot of sand by the Napoleon historian community at large. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a book uh, written by that gentleman called Napoleon the Bisexual Emperor. Yeah. And uh, we we see this because we love this idea of these great state powers becoming buddy-buddy. And, you know, I hope they at least got along, even though it sounds like many historians think Alexander I was playing Napoleon. I hope there was a spark that, oh, my God, I'm shipping them. Right you, now. I, I'm doing it. I want, <laughs> I, I want some actual Napoleon Alexander fanfic uh, to surface. We need to look into that and see if any of that exists. This episode of Ridiculous History is brought to you by Miller Lite. Did you know that Miller Lite was the beer that launched the light beer category? True story, folks. Miller Lite is the original light beer, and from the very start, it has never compromised on taste. That's because it's always brewed to have more taste with only 96 calories and 3.2 grams of carbs. Miller Lite. Hold true. But here's the thing. Alexander did give Napoleon something pretty sweet, um, aside from, you know, giving up a, a whole crap ton of his land. Mm-hmm. Um, he he had the church, the Russian Orthodox Church, withdraw uh, this notion of Napoleon as being the Antichrist in 1806. There had been a public 
um, proclamation, uh, an anathemization of Napoleon as being the Antichrist. And that largely had to do with, I didn't know this, Ben, um, Napoleon in his earlier years, those, those battles we were talking about in Egypt and Italy, he saw the plight of the Jewish people. And was quite a friend to them and um, took a lot of steps to essentially um, free them from some of the restrictions placed on them in that society. And that did not go over well uh, in in certain parts of Europe because there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Yeah, widespread discrimination, uh, active pogroms yeah, the in ghettos. some parts of the area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, discrimination in terms of housing, which jobs you could have, where you could live. And so he got this ranking or he got this opprobrium heaped on him because he was doing a decent thing. Right. Yeah. Which, again, I, I think of him as being kind of this megalomaniacal dictator dude. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it turns out he did do some pretty forward thinking stuff. <laughs> yeah. And he wasn't all uh, doom and gloom and blood and treasure. He liked to celebrate. He liked to unwind. He liked to have a good time, especially after he felt he had earned some time off. He's a work hard, play hard type of dude. And we finally made it to the subject of today's episode. We have finally made it to the summer of 1807 Uh. after signing the treaties of Tilsit and perhaps having some, uh, more than friendly feelings toward, uh, his buddy, Alexander, the Tsar, he decided to celebrate the signing by going off and having some rabbit hunting. He said, that's what I want to do. I want to relax. I want to shoot some rabbits. And he pointed at his chief of staff. I'm speculating a little bit here, but I like to imagine him pointing to his chief of staff. Oh, you know what? Uh, let's let's have a Casey on the case here. Hey, Casey, how do you pronounce Alexandre Berthier? <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, Hey, guys. I don't know how you found me. I've got, like, a different SIM card, phone number, and stuff over here. Um, Not exactly looking to be contacted. But anyway, since you did manage to get a hold of me, uh, you pronounced it as such. Alexandre Beltier. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm uh, I'm riding the metro right now. I'm going to miss my stop. So, um... Do me a favor and lose this number. All right. Talk to you when I get back. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I, I, we should have just let, let you chill. Sorry, dude. That's been Casey on the case. Ooh, we're going to be in the doghouse for that one. Ah, we should probably let him do his thing. Yeah. But hopefully he'll still send us one of those uh, sweet audio postcards we keep teasing. So... As we were speculating, or as as I'm daydreaming this moment, he points at Alexandre Berthier and says, Rabbits, get it done. I'm hunting them. Yeah. Be very, very quiet, mm-hmm. perhaps. Yeah, there we go. Kind of going back to Elmer Fudd idea. And also, for people who want a grasp of Napoleon's personality at this moment, think about those interviews you've read about the way Prince, the musician, would interact with people. Yeah, it's like, get me three giraffes and a mountain lion stat. Yeah, and and, and it's not malevolent. It's just I asked for it because it, therefore it will happen. Have you, you know? seen Have you seen that bit in the new John Mulaney stand-up where he's talking about Mick Jagger and he's like, no! no! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Give me a Coke! And then the Coke just appears yeah. in his hand like that. Funny, not funny. No! <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, that's probably how Napoleon talked. He also said, yes! He's also, we're pointing uh, we're, vigorously we're, at yeah, each other. vehemently yeah. pointing uh-huh, at each other. It's true. So, yeah, he gets this guy, his chief of staff, his mm. his major domo, mm. his number one dude, to fetch him some rabbits. And not being one to, to half-ass anything, I guess, <laughs> this guy reportedly um, got quite a lot of these little creatures, didn't he, Ben? Yes, Louis Alexandre Berthier got not like a dozen rabbits, but... Somewhere between hundreds and more than a thousand. It's tough to find a specific number. Yeah. But we do know the ballpark. And the ballpark is at least several hundreds of rabbits. And the reason he did this, and this is this is my thinking. Tell me what you think about this. The reason he did this is because he was, as he said, a real go-getter. He's chief of staff. The worst thing that could happen is for him to get, you know, a dozen rabbits. And for Napoleon not to be able to find any. 
because they're just going to let them loose in the woods. Oh, totally. They're not going to hold them by the neck and have Napoleon, you know, bop them on the head. There's a pretty fantastic account of what happened next from the Liverpool Herald from April 6th of 1901. And mm-hmm. it references one of Napoleon's generals, uh, T- T- Thibault? Yeah, yeah. Thibault. I'm liking that. Yeah. Um, and he did not apparently think too highly of Berthier. He harbored a, quote, hearty contempt um, for Berthier, who he regarded as a toady. I sort love toady. Sort love of a that. kiss ass. Yeah, a kiss ass. And a carpet knight. I don't know that one, but I, I can picture it. I wonder um, if it's like paper paper tiger. Maybe. Or maybe it means uh, someone who is a knight in title but has very little knowledge of actual fighting. I'm liking that one, Ben. Yeah. Um, so the marshal, uh, I'm going to quote from this article, the marshal in the early days of the empire invited his master to a rabbit shoot on his estate and bought a thousand of these animals to furnish sport. But how can I tell it or be believed, says Baron Thibault in his memoir, which have just been published, all those rabbits which should have tried in vain, even by scattering themselves to escape the shots which the august hand destined for them, suddenly collected, first in knots, then in a body. Instead of having recourse to a useless fight, they all faced about, and in an instant, the whole phalanx flung itself upon Napoleon. Can you translate that 1900s uh, newspaper speak, Ben? Sure. The idea was that the rabbits would scatter from a threat in all directions. That's what they were expecting and that they would be pursued by Napoleon and company and then ultimately either eradicate all the rabbits or enough to satiate Napoleon's recreational bloodlust. However, what happened instead was that the rabbits being tame and farm raised did not associate humans with predation. They associated humans with food. So that was the fatal flaw. So there's a huge mass of rabbits and they are in a new environment. They see a human being. They assume that human being can only be there to feed them. And I found, I found a really interesting look at rabbit aggression. What makes for an aggressive rabbit? And uh, there, there are two tick marks that speak to this situation. One is that a change in a rabbit's environment or routine can cause them to display aggression. And they're very routine oriented. Uh, The second is, of course, if they're hungry or if they are unaltered, meaning not spayed or neutered. And of course, at this time, these were unaltered rabbits. Unaltered rabbits. Unaltered. That is the... uh, That is the polite term. Here's how, you know how I picture this whole thing going down, How's Ben? How's that? Like this amazing clip from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Look, that rabbit's got a vicious street a mile wide. It's a killer. Get stuck. He'll do you a treat, mate. Oh, you yeah? manky Scots git. I'm warning you. What's he do? Nibble your bum? He's got huge, sharp... He can leap about... Look at the bones! Yeah! <laughs> Oh, man. So I really like to picture uh, this being at least somewhere in the vein of how things went down because these rabbits were just swarming Napoleon and his men. They were climbing up Napoleon's legs on his coat. And he had um, uh, groups of men who were uh, called beaters and they were hitting at the rabbits with like riding crops, right? Right. Yeah. As you said, Noel, the rabbits were all over them expecting their daily cabbage, which they had not received at the time. And they followed Napoleon and co. And eventually Napoleon ran away to his carriage. Just like in Runaway, the, the, the Python clip. It's, it's exactly like that. Because, you know, they thought they would be safe in, in the carriage, right? It's got doors. Uh, but no, apparently the rabbits were just like coming at them, trying to like get into the carriage, come hell or high water. They were leaping, flinging themselves into the carriage. So they literally had to drive away, (laughs) escape Mm -hmm. this torrent of bunnies. Right. The bullwhips that were cracking didn't stop the rabbits getting hit with a crop. A riding crop didn't stop them or sticks from these beaters. 
and according to historian David Chandler, with a finer understanding of Napoleonic strategy than most of his generals, the rabbit horde divided into two wings and poured around the flanks of the party heading for the imperial coach. Uh, then some of the reportedly leapt into the carriage and the attack only stopped as the coach was rolling away. From How Stuff Works and the Grammy Museum, this is Required Listening. Hear from the biggest musical artists on the planet every week. Tell me a little bit about, from your perspective, the difficulties that artists face in the rest of their lives because they're chasing, they're chasing that muse. Yeah. It's, it's the one, it's the muse keeps us alive and probably helps kill us too. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I love about my partner, Neil Young, is that, you know, his relationship with the muse of music is really insane. I mean, I think he talks to her on a daily basis <laughs> um, and he follows his muse. And sometimes it's difficult for people, but uh, you, must have, you must admit that, that, that Neil particularly uh, follows his muse. Required listening is the place to hear everyone from legends to emerging artists, discuss their inspirations and their struggles. Make sure to subscribe now on Apple Podcasts for exclusive access to the biggest musical stars on the planet. Can you imagine what it was like to be Berthier at this moment? I bet he was um, feeling pretty. Tea silly. The luncheon was ruined, that's yeah, for sure. I know. Uh, because, you know, the fatal flaw we talked about, he should have gotten wild rabbits. They would have given chase properly. They would have um, made for a delightful, uh, if uh, bloodthirsty, afternoon of, uh, you know, organized violence. But instead, it was an absolute ship show. Yeah, it was. He had, as uh, reports at the time were describing it, he had purchased rabbits from the hutch rather than the warren, so from from a farm rather than from wild, and for all his military acumen, for all his international reputation, to these rabbits, Napoleon was little more than a reticent purveyor of lettuce. He just wasn't giving up the, the goods. No, no, because he had none to give up. They weren't there to feed the bunnies. This wasn't a petting zoo. This was, uh, you know, a, a murder party. I should correct the slang there that I fell into. It was actually cabbage that they probably thought he was purveying. Oh, yeah. I guess that was the uh, the food of choice for uh, domesticated uh, bunnies. For the discerning rabbit. Yes. Indeed. Oh, man, you could be a cabbage spokesperson. It's the Grey Poupon. Of, it's the equivalent of Grey Poupon for rabbits. Cabbage gets no love. You know why, right? No. Because when you cook it, some people just hate the smell, but the secret is caraway seeds. Is that right? Yeah. To give that a shot. Has nothing to do with Napoleon, I think. It's fine. <laughs> but this, this is so fascinating to us because, you know, the image that we have of Napoleon is not that of someone who would turn tail and run, but maybe, maybe it's just so surprising and so unexpected, and there's, again, so many rabbits that he ran because of the, the surrealism of it, you know, rather than fearing for his life. I'm surely he didn't fear for his life. It's just really unusual and freakish. Now, this is pretty cool. Uh, the whole um, treaties of Tilsit thing mm -hmm. um, allied uh, France with Russia. But like you mentioned earlier, um, it was kind of considered to be a bit of a blunder on Napoleon's part because – it was not particularly likely that Tsar Nicholas I was going to um, maintain that uh, peace accord. And and as we know, everything kind of fell apart. Mm -hmm. And then Napoleon had to try to take back Russia in uh, 1812 mm -hmm. in a uh, calamitous invasion um, where he got um, his backside handed to him. And writer Nicholas uh, Karamazin wrote of Napoleon that he arrived like a tiger – but bolted like a rabbit. Ah, and so now, now we can connect the dots, right? Ridiculous historians, we can see what they were alluding to. The Napoleonic Empire, pretty shortly after that, collapsed uh, in time span from 1814 to 1815. We saw the empire fall, and Tsar Alexander acquired most of the duchy that we mentioned, and it went on to survive for years and years and years under Russian rule 
as the so-called Congress Kingdom of Poland. Well, that's the nature of the duchy, man. You, you pass it, and then mm -hmm. you got to get it passed back eventually. Um, but yeah, it, like at, for all of Napoleon's conquests and uh, military um, strategies, he kind of ended up right back where he started in terms of dominion, right? Mm -hmm. And then he actually was ultimately exiled to the island of Elba. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think he came back briefly and ruled for like this thing called the Hundred Days Campaign and then got kicked out again where he, he died in exile on another island and at the age of, uh, I think, 51. Yeah, not that old. Uh, not that old, the guy. The United Kingdom kept him on the island of St. Helena. That's the one. Which was uh, a little less than 2,000 kilometers from the west coast of Africa. And while he was in exile, he wrote a book about one of his biggest heroes, Julius Caesar. And then he eventually passed away. But he did reconcile with the Catholic Church. Today, people still debate what the cause of his death was. Uh, a lot of people think it would have been stomach cancer because his father had passed away from the same ailment. That's ending it on a little bit of a downer note. But I like to think on the positive side that a lot of those bunnies got away and maybe lived happy and full lives. Yeah, but wouldn't they be like an invasive species? Wouldn't they have just totally jacked up the ecosystem? Well, rabbits are naturally occurring part of that ecosystem, but you're right. In that massive number with the way their reproduction works, the, if they were not hunted, they would eventually cause population collapse by the sheer amount of food they consume. Yeah, because they, like 3,000 rabbits. Okay, let's, let's, be, let's be conservative. Let's call it 1,000 rabbits. Uh, multiplying, you know, like rabbits, huh? could pretty yeah. quickly overtake the scene, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it didn't sound to me like they had much time to get any shots off at these little guys before they, you know, turned tail and ducked into their carriage. Yeah, yeah, but to paraphrase the old the old saying every rabbit has their day and that afternoon maybe as many as 3,000 rabbits had their day in the sun in a very strange way perhaps they were speaking truth to power probably not but you know it's nice to think about if we write it as a screenplay clearly we're gonna go a little watership down and the rabbits can talk. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, we better get right to work on that, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, so we will leave you there, Ridiculous Historians. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode. We would like to thank uh, guest super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deccant. We'd also like to thank, of course, uh, Casey Pegram and Alexander Williams, who composed our track. We would like to thank our researcher, Christopher Hasiotis, as well as uh, Lori L. Dove for uh, busting the myth about Napoleon's height. But most importantly, we would like to thank you for tuning in. And stay tuned for next time, because we've got something cool coming up. We sure do. It's what they call a tentpole episode. <laughs> So that's all for today, folks. Bonjour, au revoir, bonsoir, whatever you got. Take it easy, guys. This episode of Ridiculous History is brought to you by Miller Lite. Oh, no, your voice is smooth as butter. Hey, I got a question. How does Miller Lite do it? You know what, Ben? I'm not entirely sure. I'll tell you what I do know, though. That is that Miller Lite has more taste and only 96 calories and just 3.2 grams of carbs. So you're telling me with Miller Lite, I'll never have to compromise on taste again. A beer so good I can drink it with my mouth? Mind blown. Yes, sir. Same here, pal. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Let me try an announcer voice. Miller Lite. Hold true.